Can you imagine working in a critical care environment without pulse oximetry? Oximetry was invented in 1935, but it wasn't until the pulse oximeter was developed in 1972 and released commercially in 1980 that this became a universal critical care monitoring modality. My name is Ken Hoffman. I'm an intensive care specialist at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. In this video, we're going to review how this incredible piece of technology works. This video is made for those sitting in the Australian and New Zealand College of Intensive Care Medicine first part examination to demonstrate the expected level of knowledge. As with all measurement and monitoring devices, there are four components to the system. One, a biological variable. Two, a sensor. Three, an integrator. And four, an output. Firstly, the biological variable that we are measuring is the percentage saturation of haemoglobin molecules in the bloodstream. To calculate this, we rely on the principle that oxygenated and deoxygenated haemoglobin have different light absorption characteristics depending on the light wavelength. We can see this visually because oxygenated haemoglobin is a bright red colour and deoxygenated haemoglobin is a deep dark red. The next component is the sensor system. This consists of a pair of light emitting diodes which emit monochromatic red light at a wavelength of 660 nanometers and monochromatic infrared light which we cannot see because it's outside the visible spectrum at a wavelength of 940 nanometers. The reason these wavelengths were selected is because at these wavelengths oxygenated haemoglobin and deoxygenated haemoglobin have very different absorptive properties. This allows us to calculate the proportion of oxygenated haemoglobin and deoxygenated haemoglobin that is present. We then have a pair of photodiodes, or light sensors, which detect how much light of each wavelength has passed through the tissues and converts this to an electrical signal. These sensors are surrounded by an opaque case to minimise the ambient light signal. Next, we have the integrator, or computer, which processes the electrical signal. This is where pulse oximetry gets very clever. In processing the signal, we need to review two physics laws, Beer's law and Lambert's law. These are often combined and termed Beer-Lambert's law. Beer's law states that the absorption or attenuation of light as it passes through a substance is proportional to the concentration of that substance. This is how the pulse oximeter calculates the concentration or relative proportions of oxygenated haemoglobin and deoxygenated haemoglobin. The second law is Lambert's law. This states that the absorption or attenuation of light as it passes through a substance is proportional to the distance the light has to travel. This is how the pulse oximeter can isolate the pulsatile component of the signal. As blood moves into the tissues with each cardiac contraction, there is a tiny but measurable increase in the distance between the light emitting diodes and the photodiode detectors. We can then isolate the pulsatile component of the signal, which reflects arterial blood entering the tissues. We do this by assessing the AC, or pulsatile component of the signal, compared to the ratio of DC, or non-pulsatile component of the signal. We do this for both 660 nanometer and 940 nanometer light wavelengths. We then combine these ratios for both 660 nanometer and 940 nanometer light into another ratio termed the R value. Once the computer has calculated the R value, it then converts the R value into an oxygen saturation level obtained from experimental data where healthy volunteers breathed hypoxic gas mixtures. This is the reason why pulse oximeters are calibrated down to a saturation level of around 75%.
Beyond this point, the curve is extrapolated as it's very hard to get ethics approval or volunteers willing to become this hypoxic. At this point, we should mention a couple of clever things the pulse oximeter does to clean up the signal. The first is to remove interference from ambient light sources. It does this by cycling through which light emitting diode is actually emitting light. 660 nanometer, and then 940 nanometer, and then having both of the light sources turned off. We can't actually see this as the light sources are flickering at up to 900 hertz. During the time that both light emitting diodes are off, the computer calculates the effect of ambient light on the photodiode detector. It can then remove ambient light from the analysis of the signal. The second is that after ambient light and non-pulsatile signal is removed, the pulse oximeter amplifies the pulsatile signal and takes an average over a few seconds before calculating the saturation. This is to try and identify and compensate for any movement artifact that has occurred. The final component of the system is the output. This includes a numerical display, usually with the saturations and the heart rate, and on higher quality monitors, a graph called a plethysmograph, which means a graph of the change in volume. This allows an assessment of the quality of the signal. So, to recap, our pulse oximeter consists of four components. One, a biological variable, which is the percentage saturation of haemoglobin. Two, a sensor, which is assessing the transmission of 660 nanometer and 940 nanometer wavelengths of light through the tissues. Three, an integrator, which is analyzing the signal from the sensor and separating out the pulsatile component of the signal. And four, an output, which is a numerical display of the saturations and heart rate and a graphical display of the quality of the signal. Thank you for listening. If this was useful, please hit the like button. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel.